Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So today, Reed, we are going to bring a two-part series to our audience about the 17 X-ray career field, which is a combination of two different career fields, really, the 17 Delta Communications Officer and the 17 Sierra Cyber Operations Officer. And to speak to both of these career fields, we have a fantastic guest here, Major Brian Thorne. I met him while I was at Vandenberg for the last five months. Fantastic human, fantastic officer, great breadth of experience with both of these career fields. Lots to cover, lots to talk about. That's why we're going to do this in two parts. Yeah. And can I just say huge thank you to Brian? We have been trying to get a 17 on this yeah. series for so long. And it's not for lack of trying. I've even had people yeah. say, yes, I'm going to do it. And then life happens and here mm -hmm. we are. So, so glad we're able to get Brian on the show. Lots of good stuff. Don't want to hold us up because there's a lot to cover. Yeah, for sure. So let's cut over here to the interview with Major Brian Thorne. Welcome to the podcast. It's good to have you introduce yourself to the audience, give them an idea of who you are, where you come from, what led you to get into the Air Force, how did you get into the Air Force, and then we'll go from there. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, I started out, so I'm a military brat, a Navy brat to be specific, so I actually wanted to go to the Navy first and follow my dad. And okay. I tried to go to Annapolis, and Annapolis said, you would not fly, no way, because of my eyesight. Oh, okay. And I said, well, okay, fine. If I can't do that, then I'm going to do the complete opposite. And I'm going to go Army. So I tried to go West Point. <laughs> Anything but the Air Force. Was, yeah. How was it that time? Two grandfathers who are retired Air Force. One's a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. Okay. And one's a retired Air Force colonel. And one of my grandfathers, who is a physicist in the Air Force, he worked on the airborne laser. Super cool. Okay, stuff. cool. He was a little annoyed with me, to put it that way, and said, why haven't you applied to the Air Force Academy? And mm -hmm. I said, well, Grandpa Dowdy, look, Air Force, it's fine. I'm sure the eyesight requirements are much higher than Army and Navy. And he said, well, I really think you need to apply. And I said, okay. So I applied to the Air Force Academy as well, not expecting anything to happen with it. Mm -hmm. And the Air Force Academy actually sent me an acceptance letter well before West Point did. Ah, okay. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess this is a good sign. And then West Point finally sent me an acceptance letter. And I thought, okay, what, what okay, do I so do? You have, you have choices. I have choices. What do I do Always right good now? Always to have options. Absolutely. So prayed about it, talked to my grandpa, talked to my parents, and talked to a lot of people and said, okay, let's, let's go Air Force. Because I had some friends that were going to the Air Force Academy as well. And I thought it would be a good idea to go someplace where I knew people. So that's kind of how I got into the Air Force itself. So that's interesting. You know, you don't hear very often that people want to go to Army and Navy mm -hmm. and then end up going to the Air Force. Right. You know, usually people are like gung-ho for one or the other, and that's going to happen or nothing at all. Right. So I'm curious, what was like the calculus? What was the, the conversations between you and your family you know, to finally make and arrive at that decision to join the Air Force? So I wanted to serve and I wanted to figure out what was the best way to serve. And I thought that the Air Force would give me the best opportunity. My dad being in the Navy, so he's a retired Naval Lieutenant Commander. He was a bombardier navigator for the A6 Intruder mm -hmm. and he was gone a lot. And so he recommended to me, you know, go to the Air Force. They've got the best family life, the best bases. Of course, all the branches tease the Air Force for what they have, the amenities for it. That's uh, because it's all true. Because it is true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my dad highly recommended, if I'm going to go to the, the military, go Air Force. And in talking to some other people, that was kind of the recommendation. Like, that's going to be the best for a family life. Because I knew I wanted to have a family and I wanted to serve and yeah. what was the best way to fit. And I thought being in the Air Force was the best way to do that. And so far, that's definitely proven to be true. Yeah, it is definitely true. That said, you know, we still love Army, Absolutely. we still love Navy, we Absolutely. love the Marines, you know, we even love the Coast Guard. Yes. <laughs> so you arrived at the decision, you, you know, accepted Air Force Academy, you 
studied what? You graduated when? So that's, this is a funny story. So my career field is I'm a cyberspace officer right now right. at Network Operations, and we'll go into that in a little bit. But my degree is actually in foreign area studies, okay. which is essentially international relations. And I had a minor in Spanish because I wanted to actually do Intel. So I talked to a lot okay. of Intel, a lot of my instructors at the academy were Intel officers in the language department, and I'd hear their stories and all the cool things they got to do. Yeah. It's like, that's what I want to do. And... So that was prepping all my four years. I'm part of the Air Force's Language Enabled Airmen Program, mm -hmm. LEAP, which yep. for everyone, if you don't know about this, it's an amazing program that the Air Force has. Well, if you have a language, you sign up for the program through the Education Center, get your commander to approve off on it, and they will send you every three to four years to go overseas and to work on the language. So for yeah. me, I speak Spanish and Portuguese. And as a result, I've gone to Mexico, to Peru, to Ecuador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Brazil, and Spain. And all as a result of this program, which is great. And actually this year I went to Peru and was able to spend a week there working with their military. Yeah. And it was incredible. One of the best experiences I've had. So highly recommend that. So tangent, I spent a lot of time focused on languages because that was my hope to do yeah. there. Now, when I entered the Air Force, I joined the Academy in 2006, uh, graduated 2010, there had been a lot of cuts to the communications career field. Okay. So the communications career field was really hurting for officers. So basically, if you put communications anywhere in your list, oh. you were going to get it. So if you put communications or space and missiles. Now, I put both on there because I knew some of my instructors, some of my mentors were communications officers. And I said, that's pretty interesting. There's some cool things. Yeah. And I didn't want to put nothing because if you put nothing there, it was needs at the Air Force. So I put Intel first. I think I put security forces, air traffic management. And then like calm, and the last was space and missiles. Because I've been to Effie Warren as a right. cadet to see the missile side. And I thought okay. that was cool. And done a space camp, so I thought that was all cool. Which kind of foreshadowing the space side yeah. later, <laughs> later on. And then when I got my AFSCE out, it was calm. So that was not expected from that side. It took me a little bit of a while to yeah. guess that. Because I was really, again, focusing the four years, all the trips to be Intel. So that was kind of had to wrestle with that for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because Intel is such a big career field. Right. You know, I don't want to say that it's not hard to get into Intel, but because it's so big, just the probabilities are kind of in your favor. Right. Especially if you've got you know, a degree and a background and maybe some encouragement from mentors, instructors, that kind of thing, that's going to help you. Yeah. It doesn't always work that way. Right, right. right. Didn't work out the same. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned space and missiles because like when I submitted my dream sheet, you know, that's what I wanted to do. More than anything, I was interested in doing the space and the missile operations or maintenance, or I was interested in like the acquisition side. And like, so the developmental engineering, and, yep. you know, that was what filled up my dream sheet. And yet the Air Force in its infinite wisdom, <laughs> right, chose to send me to civil engineering. Okay. Wow. Which is very much not right. No, totally space different. and missile, right. you know, sending things up into space or maintaining the nuclear missiles and all that. So, right. But I wouldn't change anything. Right. Right. Just a little aside here. The reason that I'm here at Vandenberg with you is because I am retraining into the space career field, Absolutely. You know, uh, getting my uh, space operations AFSC. Still as an Air Force officer, not going into the Space Force, and we'll see how all that shakes out. But it just goes to show that, you know, nothing's permanent right. uh, in, in the Air Force or the Space Force. And sometimes what you think you want is not what you're going to get. Right. Yep. And you may not want what you get. Right. <laughs> but it could actually end up being a really great thing. It was for me. Let's hear a little bit more about what your experience has been. I mean, you're still in. Absolutely. So you, you didn't hate being a communications officer. Right. Yep. At least not enough to quit. So <laughs> so let's go that direction now. So you graduated from the academy in 2010. Yep. You're going to be a comm officer. Where'd you go next? So then I went to, after 60 days that the academy gives all of the cadets, I went to Costa Rica for a month of language training, which okay. was awesome. So with this cool down there. I met with a whole bunch of about 20 or so of us officers that were there, which was really neat. And then went to Kiesler, was there for about nine months, did school for six months and did training there for one of the seventh class to go through undergraduate cyber training, okay. as it was called through that time. So it was all brand new. They had literally just right before them, the instructors had started everything. They had been working really hard to get the curriculum up and running, the capstone, everything. Yeah. So it had that brand new feel and sense to it. Mm -hmm. Which class are you? did you go through? 
for, for space training, for space. sorry. So I'm uh, officer class five for the FY22. 22, okay. Which that was a foreshadowing because I had worked on the new version of underwear space training that you went through. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of like a foreshadowing for me. Like I've been with new sets of training kind of throughout my career as one of the first classes to go through undergraduate cyber training. I helped with undergraduate space training. I also helped lead the effort to start now it's undergraduate cyber warfare training. So that's kind of been a common yeah. theme throughout my career is helping with training a lot. Yeah, so you've done a, a few different things with the comm slash cyber, and you know, you can explain all that. You know, over the course of uh, your career, you've been in you know twelve, 12 years, years yeah. now. So yeah, give us a few more of those highlights of where Absolutely. you've been, what you've done, what, that's brought you up to this point. So after Kiesler went to Buckley, now Space Force Base, but Air Force Base back then. So my mm-hmm. wife, Eleanor, and I, um, we were engaged at the time. And I said, I just want to be in Colorado. That just anywhere in Colorado. Yeah. And I thought Peterson and Shriver. So as a cadet, I spent a lot of time in Colorado Springs. I had spent time in Denver and I got to the airport, but I actually never knew there was a base in Denver, which I feel really bad about that. And most people don't actually. Which is crazy. And then they said, okay, here's your orders to Buckley. And I said, where's Buckley? It's in Denver. And I said, no, there's no base in Denver. <laughs> right. I lived in there for four years. There's no Denver. And then I looked it up. I'm like, wow, I didn't know. Didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah, not a big base, but a very no, important one. Very much so. Very much so. So that was exciting. Went there. We moved, uh, lived in Aurora, beautiful part of Colorado. And I was with the Second Space Warning Squadron. Cool. And we was with the software tester for them out there, which was something I had never done before. So learned. I had a lot of great uh, senior NCOs and NCOs that kept me from doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. And I learned a lot from them. Did that for about a year, two years, then a deployment opportunity came up. Okay. Um, one of the CGOs in the comm score, no, actually it was another base entirely, was not able to go. So they reached out to me, talked to my commander, talked to my flight commander. And they, I said, what did you think? And he said, well, at this point, since you're in the space world, you're not a space officer, but you're in the space world, yeah. you really need to take advantage of this deployment. So went deployed. It was great. Got to go to visit a couple of countries actually was at one point was the senior communications officer as a first lieutenant, which was super exciting, yeah. super scary as well, having to tell 06 <laughs> is what was going on and you know, getting phone calls at all hours of the night. And yep. just like, all right, here we go. Here's something's down. Let's go tell the commander and let's hope it works. Yeah, man, I just wish that people would understand that piece of things about sometimes the pitch comes your way and you may not be ready for it. Right. So be ready for it. Very much so. <laughs> Very much so. You know, you said that somebody else was supposed to go on the deployment, but they yes. couldn't. So you went. Yep, Absolutely. You get there and all of a sudden you're first lieutenant around, you know, these senior officers representing this capability, this career field, and you got to perform. Very much so for an entire base, entire base, first lieutenant, you're it. Here we go. That's crazy. So I spent a lot of time, was locked up in sync with my senior master sergeant, amazing senior master sergeant, and making sure that we were good to go. Yeah. Trial by fire. You learn fast. Very much so. Oh man, things can go awry very quickly. Yes, they could. Came back from that and then went back to Buckley and went to the comm squad in there. So worked in their network operations shop for a little bit and then went to their plans and program shop afterwards. Mm-hmm. So that was neat to do that. So you kind of an other side of communication. So most of the time when we think of communications on the communication side, you think of the fixing the computers, the radios, yeah. the telephones, the hands-on work. Typical but information technology absolutely. type. The geek squad. As I yeah, used to okay, say, yeah. I tell people like, I'm the geek squad of the Air Force. That's I'm Best Buy, Geek Squad, AT&T, all rolled into one. That's what I do yeah. uh, for the longest of time. Plans and programs is, okay, well, how do you bring the new comm capability to a building? So you build a building, it's great, but did you think Think about where do you bring the Wi-Fi? Now, as we move into houses, of course, you bring your Wi-Fi router, you're fine. Yeah. But like a big building that you can't have Wi-Fi in, how do you get internet there? And how yeah. do you connect everything? So that all has to be planned out and should be planned out. So that's the plans and program side. It's also where yep. we handle the money, right? Which I know you guys have talked a little bit about money in your podcast. Like, do we understand the colors of money and what money we can use for this project or not that project? Right. So that was all really important for me to learn. Yeah, and the opportunity to interface with other squadrons like very much CE so. and CE. finance yep, and very contracting. Much so. yep. 100%. And then I got a phone call out of nowhere that someone said, hey, would you like to come work for us at the National Reconnaissance Office oh, okay. in a row? And I was like, I've heard of that. I didn't know you could say that. Okay. And so like, all right, let's do some research about that. And went to Las Cruces, New Mexico. Amazing assignment. I was a flight commander for the network operations. So we made sure again, all the computers, radios, Mm -hmm. telephones, all that good stuff was up and running for four years, which is rare. Most of the time you're only a flight commander for about a year to two years. In total, I've spent five years 
as a flight commander, four years on the operation side and then one year as a program side. Cool. So I think that set me up really well for my future assignments because having five years of flight command experience is a lot because you deal with everything from the discipline side to I'm interacting with people to learning how to be a subject matter expert. Right. I, thankfully, at the end of I say about the third year, beginning of my fourth year as the network operator, I felt like, okay, I've got this. Yep, I know it may sound pride to say, but I'm this me for this. And so you knew, I know what I know. I know everyone. I don't know specifically. I know exactly who to get yeah. to and I can give you an answer. And so that was neat leaving the, especially when I left um, Las Cruces, having that sense of people coming up and say, say, thanking me for all the work I had done. Thanking me for just being that to me and working hard to be that to me. And I had an amazing team there. I mean, that's really how yeah. I became that. They taught me a lot between the senior NCOs, the NCOs, the civilians, the contractors. We had an amazing flight, one of the best flights I've ever had great family atmosphere. And they definitely set me up for success. And even now when people come from that place, they'll say, oh, I heard your name. And I, my first thought, like, is <laughs> it good or bad? And like, oh no, it's good. Like, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I would say one encouragement for that with any brand new CGO is work on becoming that SME in your job. Because you want to leave your job with people saying, oh, he or she is that SME. So it's a wonderful feeling. You feel like you've accomplished something and you have that trust because when you can go sit down in a meeting and people say, well, what do we think about this? And you respond, yes, that'll work. Or no, that absolutely will not work. And people take you at your yeah. word and leave it at that because they know you're this me. That's an amazing feeling that you can't really get anywhere else. Yeah, it's all about building your legacy. Yes. And, and people often think about legacy being something that comes way down the line. You know, after you have been in the military for 12, 15, 25 years, and then you retire and you're a lieutenant colonel or a colonel or something like that. And that's when you've, quote, have built your legacy, right? But that's not really the case. Like you, right. you can start building legacy. You can leave things better than you found them now. Absolutely. Right? You can do that even before you get into the military. In fact, that's a good idea. Yes, right? it is. Your reputation 100%. will precede you. Yes, it does. Not just what you leave behind. So I'm glad that you brought that up. So you were in New Mexico for a number of years. Yep, four years. Four years. Okay. And then you went to... And I went back to Keesler. Back to Keesler. So okay. Yeah, again, one of those life stories where it wasn't planned. We have this new thing. I don't know if y'all talked about Talent Marketplace. A little uh, bit, yeah. A little bit. So Talent Marketplace, for all the listeners, basically it's a website where the Air Force says, here's all the jobs that's available. And then you say, okay, here's which jobs I want. You kind of bid. basically think of it as like backyard football. You're in the backyard and you're waiting, pick me, pick me. And you're waiting to see who's going to pick you. So you put down, you put stars. Basically, yeah. I want to be... These are the basic I want to go to. This is the basis I really don't want to go to. And here are the jobs I want to do. So I had put all that down. My wife and I talked about it. Good to go. And then my commander, we were at a, and I statistically remember this, we were at a going away party for one of our friends. And we were upstairs because it was a two-story restaurant and the commander pulls us aside, Lieutenant Colonel Gonzalez. And she said, so I know that you guys really, really didn't want to go to Keesler. <laughs> and I'm like, I know where this is going. And there's the drop in your stomach. Exactly. And she said, but it looks like that's where we're going. We're going there. And I said, all right. So again, I really appreciate how she brought it up. And we talked about it a couple of times. She gave me some good mentorship about it. And then I was like, all right, here we go. Let's be an instructor. And that was a good challenge for me on a professional level and personal level, mm -hmm. because I went from being, again, a flight commander for five years straight to, I talked with my commander and he said, okay, let's test with you you have all this leadership experience. I could put you in a flight command right now, but you've already done that. Yeah. Let's get some instructor experience for you, but can you do it and go from being a flight commander, being in charge of everything to now you're kind of on the bottom of the food chain again, which was really hard to deal with going yeah. from being in charge. And, not, and plus I was getting close to pin on major. Right. So it was a very kind of professionally awkward situation for me. Made the most of it. It was easier in the sense of, like, okay, I didn't have as much to do, but it was a different pace because you were with AETC and AETC, of course, has its own set of rules and regs. Right. So learning how they roll, going, okay, well, what are we teaching right now? And I looked, one of the things I looked was a lot of the material was similar to stuff that I had gone through when I was a second lieutenant. And I thought, okay, this is not good. Yeah. I mean, it's been, at that point, I had been in nine years, I think is when I got to Keesler. Yeah, nine years. And I thought, this is not good. I know cyber has changed a lot in nine years and we're not teaching the students. So kind of a small cadre of us, or really two of us, Ace and I started making it happen. Ace had done it first and then I followed with and we kind of, not rebels, but just kind of like, let's we're going to do it on our own. We're going to yeah. start changing the curriculum on our own. And then as we were trying to change things, so Ace was working on some stuff he thought was really important for the students to know, connecting basically the cyber world to the air world. And I thought, well, as you're doing that to the air world, I'm going to connect the, the cyber world to the space world because that's what I know. Yep. And one of the things that was really important for Ace and me is that we needed to make sure that the students understood multi-domain warfare. 
buzzword, right? Understood yeah. how do we fight in air, space, cyberspace, land, sea, under the sea, everywhere. Yeah. Because a lot of the times in most of the schoolhouses, they only teach just that discipline. Yeah. And so you leave the schoolhouse and you just know cyber, you just know space, you just know air. And okay, to some point as a brand new second lieutenant, you need to know that you're fine. But as you get going on your career, you need to see that there's more, like where do you fit in the bigger picture? Because we don't just fight in one domain, we fight in multiple domains. Right. And so where do we learn that? And I think that's one thing that in the joint environment, our army and Marine brethren do a lot better at teaching their CGOs than we do in the Air Force. I think Space Force is getting better and I think the Air Force is getting better. But when I went through, we did not do a good job teaching joint and how that worked. You're yeah. just kind of focused and then you get in a joint environment and you see, oh, like there's a lot more that we're doing and supporting that's just my piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle, right. but it's not the whole picture from there. So that was our kind of ace enemy trying to say, how do we connect that? So I recreated a space and satellite communications class for them. It was great, a lot of fun by my connections there, I was able to then bring cyber to the undergraduate space training where yep. how you and I met yep. at undergraduate space training and go, okay, how let's bring that multi-domain idea to as much of training as possible that we can connect everything where. So that was my, not claim to fame, but my the most biggest highlight that I did when I was at Keesler. Cool. Did instructor duty for about a year. Really thankful that I didn't. When I was in high school, I did Toastmasters. So this is plug out to Toastmasters International. High schoolers that are interested in coming and joining the Air Force, one of the things you can do right now as an officer in the prep is join Toastmasters because they're going to teach you how to speak both in formal settings and informal settings. And I cannot tell you how many times throughout my 12-year career, it's been, hey, sir, can you go speak at this graduation? When is it? Right. Now. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. And you're like thinking like, okay, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And then also plug out, because I know um, you and Reed have talked about the importance of reading. Yeah. So as you're walking down, so Toastmaster experience, impromptu speaking, and then all the books I've read, okay, what book can apply to the situation? Good. You're walking from your office to the graduation, done. Now you have a five-minute speech prepared based upon the Toastmaster training and whatever books right. you've read recently. And so that, as officers and as high schoolers, again, if you want to be an officer, two great things, reading a lot and going to Toastmasters International be phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Again, when the pitch comes your way, be ready to swing. Absolutely. That's a great way to do it. It's going to come a lot. It's going to come a lot. Yeah. Uh, so after the C's, after instructor, I was switched over to assistant director of operations with the 333rd training squadron. That's the training squadron Kiesler that does undergraduate now cyber warfare training. And my primary task was to rebuild the curriculum. So from what Ace and I had worked on more informally to let's the career field set as a whole, let's do this formally. Let's reset. Yeah. So we went through here are all the tasks the students need to learn. Let's redo the curriculum and redo everything. Now, downside of so when we did this for undergraduate space training, I'll backtrack. We had multiple groups of SMEs, the subject matter experts, that were flown into Colorado, mm -hmm. and I was part of one of those. And you had basically, I think it was about a month that we were there, close to a month, and that's all we did was develop curriculum. Yeah. We tried to do the same thing with undergraduate cyber training, but then COVID hit. Oh, so yeah. literally, we start, see, because it's COVID was hitting beginning of 2020, we're like, ah, uh, let's see what happens. February comes up okay, this is getting a little worried. March comes up. And I think March, because we had started in full swing in March, and that's when the bases started locking everyone down. And so we said we yeah. had to send all the SMEs home because if you guys don't get home now, there's a good chance you're going to be stuck with us. Right. Which we'd love to have you, but you, your families probably want you more than we do. So we'll send you all home. So that completely, I would say, derailed redoing the curriculum for undergraduate cyber training because instead of trying to have a cadre of SMEs that were there that they could do the curriculum development while the instructor still taught, now we had the instructors doing both, which yeah. is super hard because like you've seen as, as a student, you know, you're instructing or so hours a day, depending upon the time, and then to be expected to do curriculum after that, unless you're really, really dedicated to it and you have the time and the energy to do it, mm -hmm. you just, it's not, just not going to happen. It's not feasible. Right. So it took a long time to kind of develop that, I mean, there's times when, because of we were all teleworking or a lot of us were teleworking, that it was just, I was in my office, maybe there's one other guy, and then there's the commander. And I think in a whole two-story building, there might've been six of us. Yeah. Because we were all social distancing and we had no idea what to expect because of COVID. So that threw everything out the window. And of course, you don't plan for a pandemic to come in. <laughs> so we were not ready for that at all. So trying to, how do we work around that? That was a good leadership lesson, a good patience lesson. And then going forward, if I ever do something like this, go, okay, what are some, how do you use, kind of like you said, Zoom? How do we use Zoom? How do we use Microsoft Teams? How do you use um, like Slack? You know, yeah. and all these other apps 
how can we at least still get a product going? It's not traditional like we would normally do it, but we can still make things happen. How can we safely bring people back into the building? Maybe do shifts so that we can do the classified stuff. How do we get all of that together? It was definitely a big planning exercise, something I had never done before. So you have in the military, we have, of course, military planning, joint planning. Yep. But then there's project management. And there's a book I really like that's in the Franklin Covey series called Project Management for the Unofficial Project Manager, mm -hmm. which is something I've read multiple times. I read it while I was at Keesler because developing an entire course is a project, Absolutely. 100%. But for a lot of us as officers, we don't have any specific project management training. It's all ad hoc. And right. that for me was like, okay, how do I do this project and then reading the book and applying that. But we looked at that, the cadre, for those of us who are still in the building or who are still there, said if we need to bring project management into, this is a tangent, into training so that all of the brand new lieutenants can actually have some type of flavor, a couple of days of project management. Because as an LT, I've never been a hacker or anything like that. Yeah. But I've been a project manager pretty much from day one. As soon as I graduated, right. like as a second lieutenant, like here's a project LT. And I was like, I took one class of project management at the academy. I've heard the name. It's like management 101. Beyond that, I have no idea. So that's something we're trying to change again, tangent with the LTs to go through. Yeah, but that's a really important tangent. Yes. And one that I know we haven't talked any real length on the podcast about is that's one of the most valuable skills that you're going to develop as an officer. Yes. Regardless of the career field that you end up in, um, as long as you like get to the point where you're not necessarily doing the SME type stuff, right? Where you know, such as the pilots, you know, they're not managing a project when they're flying a jet, right? No. But when they're not flying, what are they doing? Yep, they're managing a project, yep. right? And what does the world outside of the military want people to do? Project managers, project management. Yep, absolutely. And so that is such a crucial skill that every officer can and should and you know will develop right. some better than others. And so if you can be more deliberate and purposeful about it, then all the better, right? Absolutely. Well, like the podcast you had about the LT that does the side hustle, mm -hmm. right, with her, that's a perfect example. Like even if you're not going to be an entrepreneur, you can still prep yourself. In a way, it's a side hustle by, can you get your PMP certification or yeah. whichever project management certification you're interested, get Sigma, which is different, but it's important as well. Getting some type of project management certification or training right now as an officer and then putting yourself in those projects so that when you get out, mm -hmm. and I was talking to a friend of mine who got out recently, he said, the fact that he had a Six Sigma was huge. Yep. He said that was big. And the fact that he had done a project recently and he was able to put that on his resume, combine that with Six Sigma, is like, that's how, honestly, Brian, I got a job. Yep. It was the project manager side. It's not the fact that I was a pilot. It's the fact that I had project management experience and I had some type of certification. And I was able to show through turning my OPRs, my performance reports into resumes, that I knew how to be a project manager. Absolutely. Like, That's huge so for the young officers right now. If you're not looking into that, you need to start looking into that ASAP. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to transition here from talking about like what you've done up to this point, which is uh, so much. <laughs> I mean, you've been around the block a couple of times. Yep. But the way that I want to make this transition is kind of like the transition in the language that you were using as you sure. were describing your career. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody in the audience picked up on this, but I want to highlight it here. You started out as a comm officer yep. and you were describing communications operations. And you did that kind of stuff for a little bit, doing the support desk, but then shifting over to networks and Absolutely. plans programs, those kinds of things. But then somewhere in there, you started using the word cyber instead of yeah. communications. And I don't know if you consciously we're doing that or if that's just like how things were or if that's just a good way of describing what's happened to the career field in general and I, you know we're going to talk about that because communications is a huge thing right that every branch of the military especially the air force and space force rely very heavily on but it's not just the ability to enable communications it's not just to enable people to communicate with each other but there are actual wartime effects that can take place through these communications channels that then get the term cyber. Absolutely. And this has been more or less a recent development it is. within the Air Force and the Space Force, recognizing that cyber is a war fighting domain. Yep. And now we need to capitalize on it. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to highlight that that was... Absolutely the transition that you were making just in the way the way that you were describing your own career but that's what's been happening with the air force and the space force in general it is so 
let's switch gears now and sure. talk a little bit more about like the career field, you know, 17X, which, right. you know, encompasses multiple different disciplines. And we'll let you talk to what those different disciplines are. Absolutely. So one of the things, so I'll compare this to the Army. So the Army right now, the way they switch it is they have people who are just dedicated as cyber operations officers. Okay. And that's its own MOS. And then they have, and so that's the cyber side, the warfare side. Yeah. And then they have the signals officers, which would lead the signal core, mm -hmm. and they're responsible for calm. Okay. So Army, two totally different MOSs. And right now you can't see it, but I'm using a lot of hand gestures yeah. on that side <laughs> to do that. Um, so the difference. For us in the Air Force and in Space Force, we have one career field. So one MOS, one group, one AFSC, and then we haven't decided what our names are going to be, but one career field that does two totally different missions for us, which pros and cons, it makes life interesting. We'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. So within the cyberspace operations officer, so if you just Google cyberspace operations officer and go to US Air Force, you'll see kind of the list and we'll talk about the minimum education and qualifications. But within that, we have four specialties. Yeah. So like in space, right, you have the four specialties that y'all have. We have similar. So you have your electronic warfare. We have offensive cyber operations and defensive cyber operations. Yeah. Um, we also have combat communications and then we have network operations and we'll go through all of those. So you have the offensive and defensive cyber operations. Those are under the 17th Sierra. And their offensive, of course, is, sounds like you're the hacker's defense. You're defending your network. Mm -hmm. Then under the 17 Deltas, you have the combat communications, combat comm. Those are like the Marine Corps of comm. Um, okay. Those guys are very hua, very tough. They love, <laughs> I mean, seriously, that they are a totally different breed, which you need that. Yeah. They're very physically fit, very out there in the field. You know, your own separate unit. You have to provide everything. You love ruck marches and carrying your M4 and you know, going along Eating with marches, MREs. Easing MREs and living in tents and basically being Army and Marine Corps. And they love it. And those guys... The officers that I've seen do it, they are a different and special breed because they have to be because of what they do. Because yep. they will literally go out. So CE will go out with Red Horse and create a base from nothing. Yep. And then Comet Com will go out there and they will be there. And they have to take care of themselves. So you have to be alone and unafraid. Yep. And so you need a very special and you need to have an officer who's going to do that, who can, as a second lieutenant, be in charge of a team. And you may be under fire. You may be, especially with great power competition that were coming up, right? right? You're going to be in a place that's probably hostile and you can't be an officer who's afraid to make hard decisions. You yeah. have to be tough. And so why I may say a little bit teasingly with Marine Corps, but I mean, seriously, right? The Marine Corps, their second lieutenants, first lieutenants, they got to make some tough decisions right. from there. If you want to do combat comp, you've got to be willing to make tough decisions. And then you have what I do, the network operations, which is a jack of all trade. Okay. Uh, so they kind of throw us everything. So I've done what would be a traditional combat comm job when I was deployed because we took what was essentially a, a bear base where literally you saw cables all along the ground yeah. and nothing was actually permanent and we turned it into a permanent base. So we did that and kind of an engineering and installation job, which is more of the expeditionary side. Yep. Tons of fun. And I love that mission. And I, honestly, I would love to do that mission again because it was great to see a literal base come up. And after right. six months, you see something happen. It's great. And I said, I've done a little bit of software testing, which was random and not something I expected to do. I've done the traditional plans and programs. I've done making sure the network's working, so your internet's working. And then now, as the DO of the 65th, uh, the Director of Operations of the 65th Cyberspace Squadron, I'm in charge of both kind of an engineering installation side, was in charge of the network operations, and now the defensive cyber operations mm -hmm. of making sure, okay, once you build the network, can you defend the network? Right. And being the jack of all trades, they expect you. Like, we're going to throw this specialty into basically wherever we need you from there. And the majority of the students who go to undergraduate cyber warfare training, at least when I was an instructor there, that's what's going to happen. Is you're going to be thrown into any situation, which is why they're trying to give such a breadth of information to you when you go to undergraduate cyber warfare training. Yeah. So just to summarize that, make yeah. sure that I understand it and also for the audience. So within the 17X, yep. there's the 17 Sierra, which is the offensive and defensive cyber operations. Yep. And then you also have the Delta, which is combat comm, uh, typical communication slash IT. The network operations guys. Yep. And just those two? or the, Just those two. Okay. And then within those, like combat comm will do the traditional combat comm mission going to an expedition, like place that's bare base and creating a base from nothing. Yeah. And the engineering and installation side okay. from there. And then you have the jack of all trades, the network operations guys, me, who they can pretty much fit. We can basically do every single role with the exception of offensive, because that requires a very specific training pipeline yeah. and very specific rules and authorities. And anybody who goes to Keesler for the undergraduate cyber warfare school, 
is that the only one school or is there That's a separate the only one, school. Two, one for communications or it's just that just they go one there school. and they get shredded out to yep. Sierra or Delta? Yep. From okay. that school. So, you, so as an okay. instructor, the interesting thing is you're teaching everyone yeah. from the people who are the geniuses. You think of it like a child prodigy and playing the piano, but do that with a computer that they just know computers inside and out. Yeah. To your teaching to people who honestly have history, English, language degrees. So I'm raising my hand yeah, right sorry. now. This guy, say. right? <laughs> like me, who was like, well, I know how to use a computer and I took one comp sci class, computer science class, and here we go. So you have to find a way to bring all of them to a, some type of foundational knowledge so that we can send you out. And then there's going to be more training. So the way that undergraduate cyber warfare training is now or the way that they want to go to is basically you have what's foundational. Mm-hmm. Here's your foundational with understanding. Here's how computers and networks work. And then here's your planning because planning has become an important side because that's something that's very important yeah. as an officer. Project management. And then they split you out to more specialized training there to either with the Delta or the Sierra side. Okay. So you mentioned that you're going to have this breadth of maybe background or capability yes, or uh, yeah. or passion and desire to learn this yes. kind of stuff. Uh, so let's talk just real quick about like the requirements to be a, a cyber operations officer or a Delta because you know, they're going to start in the same place, yeah, right? Absolutely. So background, bachelor's degree, absolutely. certifications or anything, you know, how does one get into these career fields? So to start out, so again, if you go to the Air Force website on there, they're going to say bachelor's degree with a focus in computer and information sciences, engineering, mathematics, computer science, management, information systems, or other related disciplines. I would say computer engineering is another one. I know the academy has cyber science as well. I don't know if other schools have something similar. I imagine that they do. But basically anything focused on either cyber warfare, cybersecurity, or basically how computers work. Okay. Now, I will caveat all of this mm-hmm. with... Well, first, if you're a high schooler or college student and you're thinking of you want to go into cyber and you want to be a hacker, you want to go to the offensive side because that's yeah. the cool stuff, you will only get to operate as, as an operator, hands-on keyboard, for maybe one assignment. Which is like that's three years. Three years, yeah. And of those three years, you're going to have probably a year or so of training. Mm-hmm. And then you're probably going to operate maybe for a year, and then they're going to put you to some type of leadership position, at which point you won't be trained. So realistically, as an officer, you're only going to have maybe one year that you're truly operating. I could be wrong, but that's kind of the norm. So what I would say to the officers is for someone who needs those degrees to understand the career field, but you're going in with either computer science, computer engineering, computer security, cyber science degree, not because you're the operator, because so that you can understand the operators. Right. That's, Who are the operators? So the operators way? are the one Bravo Force. Okay. So they're they're enlisted, enlisted career field. Enlisted career field. They are super smart men and women, and that is their bread and butter is cyber warfare, either offense or defense. They're the ones who are going to do the hands-on keyboard stuff. You will be leading them. So mm-hmm. you need to understand what they're saying when you get there. And that's what our training is going to do is we are going to teach you the jargon to understand what they're saying yeah. so you can make informed decisions. Now, granted, as a second lieutenant or as a first lieutenant, and even as a junior captain, you should not be making decisions <laughs> without at least asking your senior NCO right. or your flight chief for help. For like, how should, are we doing this? You're getting that mentorship. But you need to be able to walk in and understand what's going on. Yeah. So if you are a high schooler and a college student and you say, you know what, I really like cyber warfare, but I want to do the hands-on keyboard mm-hmm. and I want to do it for a long time, then you need to look at being a one Bravo four enlisted okay. from there. And that's a hard thing for our career fields. We're struggling with as a career field is how long the officers get to operate. Cause we have a lot of very smart lieutenants, right. a lot of men and women that they want to be operators, that they have computer science, cyber degrees, and they want to be the hands on keyboard. And that's just not the way that the air force is set up. And I think we've done a little bit of disservice to them mm-hmm. because in the training, again, from my experience, when I was a lieutenant going through, being an operator was the focus. Like, we're going right. to try to get you to be an operator. And of course, when I got to my first assignment, yes, I did software testing maybe for like a month or so. The very less, I was in charge of software developers, right. but I didn't do it for that long. I mean, for 12 years, I haven't really been a hands-on keyboard guy. Yeah. That's it. And I didn't even have a science background. But for the guys and gals who do have it, that's hard. And I think yeah. that's where we lose a lot of the officers at the four-year point. They get out because they say, well, I want to be hands-on keyboard and I can't. And there's no warrant officer in the Air Force. Right. There's no methods to do it. So... I'm just going to get out and I'm going to either be a contractor and do this or I'm going to be a civilian and do this. That's why I want to give that disclaimer is even though the degree is required, it's required so you understand, not required so that you actually do. Right. And that's really important to get And that's get so out. true across so many of the, the, the officer career fields. Interestingly, that's not so much the case for our pilots. Right. 
And so what you're describing here, what's happening you know, to the three and four year cyber operations officer is what's happening to the eight, nine, 10, 11 year pilot, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just interesting to hear that, you know, it's not so unique to just the flying world or to the cyber operations world or anywhere else. All of the career fields have this issue of officers wanting to be too tactical. Right. Versus accepting the additional responsibility, the leadership that comes with the commission. Right? Absolutely. That, that's why we're officers. Absolutely. You know, Reed and I have talked lots about that, and you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll bring it up again, <laughs> but it is a challenge yes. uh, you know, across the Air Force, across the Space Force, in every career field is balancing how technically expert and operationally proficient do we want our officers to be before they start taking on the additional responsibility of their rank, their commission, and what the Air Force and the Space Force needs them to do. I enjoy history a lot. And I think from a historical perspective, I think one of the reasons that we struggle with this specifically in the Air Force is one of my very good friends, he's a retired master sergeant, told me, he's like, in the Air Force, we send our officers to fight. Right. No, and that's totally different. Only in the flying world. Only in the flying world, right? In the flying world. And I think a lot of us have that in the Air Force, we have the, we want to be, I mean, that's why we have cyber wings. We have space wings, right? right? We have that desire, right? To be kind of part of that flying world. Mm -hmm. And so we think as officers, we want to be able to fly. And that's not how the Army does it. That's not how the Marines do it. Based upon what I've seen, right? I doubt that's how the Navy does it either, unless for the flying world. Right. So... I think if we can, as the Air Force, explain that up front when we're recruiting and talking to young high schoolers and to college kids with wanting to go to OTS of this is what it means up front, I think they would have a better, I think we would retain more people if they understood what it meant to be an officer coming in. I know sometimes that prior enlisted when they become officers, that's something, it's a transition for them. How do I just take it from going from being the hands-on guy or gal to know I need to then teach and lead? It's not my job to do that, but... It's a public affairs campaign in a way for us teaching that this is what it means to be an officer. Yeah. And which is, I'm really glad that y'all have this podcast. I think you're doing a great job of explaining that. That message was absolutely not there. Yeah, we're trying to get after that problem. It's a big hairy one that everybody likes to point to, but you know, it's hard to solve right, uh, big is. hairy problems. But we're going to try anyway. But on that note... You know, you've explained what the career field is, kind of the officer role is within the career field. They're not the operator. They're supposed to understand and support the operator. But here's my question that I often ask. Why have cyber operations officers at all? Like, what do you bring to the fight? So we bring the money. (laughs) <laughs> That's our job. Uh, what, I, what I mean by that is it's our job to empower and advocate. And I'm still in yeah. something. So that was the, uh, heard this phrase from, I think it was J Mac from One's Ready Podcast. Yeah, we're big fans uh, of One's Ready. Yeah, awesome podcast. Love it. Listen to it a lot. And I think it was J Mac that made that comment. As an officer, it's your job to empower and advocate. And that's what we bring to the fight from there. So as an officer, you have a seat at the table. And you're literally right now, we are at my kitchen room table, I'm our homeschooling table. And to kind of think of metaphorically speaking, when you're an officer, your voice is heard. Mm-hmm. from there that in a way that your senior NCO or NCO may not be heard. Now, I will say, having spent a lot of time with foreign militaries, our enlisted core, our NCO core, our senior NCO core, is respected a lot more here oh, yeah. in the United States than, I won't say the name, but I went to a certain country and one of our NCOs was speaking and that individual did not get the respect at first, our NCO, and the NCO was the expert. And they would ask me the question and he would answer. I would defer to him because he knows more about this than I do. And it wasn't until basically they saw that I was comfortable with him and he proved that he knew the expertise, even though he had it, that they started talking to him directly. Here, we are much further along. But as an officer, you're going to be in meetings that your senior NCOs or NCOs will not be in. Yeah. And as you go higher ranking and your voice, like right now I'm a DO, I'm in a lot of meetings that no one else is in. It's like me and the commander, and maybe there's a lot of other commanders. And that's it. There yeah. are no NCOs. There are no senior NCOs. So if you're not there to give that voice and say, this is what my team needs, no one's going to give that voice. And you are the only one, if you're in that chain of command, that's going to fight for your team because no one else is fighting for your team at all, other than you and your commander. Yeah. So that's what we bring is we empower and we advocate for our team in the meetings, for the money, yep. for resources, whatever you need that maybe our chiefs aren't in there or senior master sergeants or master sergeants aren't in those meetings. And we have to be the ones to do that. 
So that's true what you're saying across the Air Force. But I also want to like look at like the aspect of delivering effects, cyber effects. What is the role that the officer plays in enabling operators to do their job? You know, what authorities do you possess? You know, where does the responsibility lie for operations? You know, can you describe a little bit more how the officer integrates with the operators in that regard? Absolutely. So one of the things, so using my experiences, some of my recent experiences, our responsibilities are one, we got to plan the mission. So if the planning okay. is messed up, that's on us, 100%, because we lead the mission planning cells. Okay. That's us. Now, granted, yes, the senior NCOs and the NCOs are there, but we are the leaders. That's how it is right now. So if there's something wrong with the planning, that falls upon us as the officers okay. from there. So that means we did not, A, we didn't empower our team right. We didn't advocate for them to have the resources. We told them to do something wrong, mm -hmm. or we failed to make sure that everyone in our meetings as we were planning understood, here's our bounds. You can do X, you can do Y, do not do Z. And if they did Z, that falls back on us. Yeah, okay. And I've had to in the past, working with people, fire people because they almost did Z. And that would have come down on me, first and foremost, as the officer, like, why did you let your person, you failed to train your person if I hadn't done that. So that's one of the first things is the responsibility falls upon you, first and foremost, as the officer. So as you're planning the planning side. Yeah. When something goes wrong or doesn't go well, the first person they go to is not to the operator, they go to you mm -hmm. as the officer. Because yep. again, they say as the officer, you know, we're responsible to organize, train, and equip with them within the units. Did you organize well? Did you train your operator? Because especially like as me as the DO, it's my responsibility to tell the commander, yes, sir, this list of 10 operators, they're good to go. Yep. So I am telling the commander, you can accept this risk that they can be alone and unafraid on the network. Yeah. And if something goes wrong, they're not going to get fired. He's going to get fired. <laughs> now, before he gets fired, he's going to come to me and go, you told me, yeah. based upon the training that I'm supposed to be involved with, that they were all good. What went wrong? Yep. And that's what we're constantly going through the training. That's why we have, we're creating the standardization evaluation shop, we've got a weapons and tactics shop, that we're all looking at the training properly prepare the operators. And as I've told the operators, our goal is I'm going to create operators that you guys can be alone and unafraid on the network. That is our goal. Yeah, That's my mantra. That's my vision. And I try to say it as many times as possible to the team. Because if it doesn't happen, that comes back on me. Yeah, I failed. That's the DO. I'm going to get asked for it. So that's where I say with the operators, that is we plan the missions, we train them. And then if something goes wrong, we are the ones that are responsible for it. Yeah. The reason I bring this up, because I want to drive home the point that the cyber career field that delivers actual effects. It's not just making sure that you have internet and the ability to make a phone call. Right. It's Absolutely. so much more than that. And these effects can have real impacts on 100% they do. Yep. the lives of people. You can break stuff and kill things, right? right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just like we say in the flying world, right? Right. Very much so. And so there has to be that authority, that person where responsibility and accountability flows to. Absolutely. Right? And that's the officer. That's us, yeah, 100%. Now, for me, you may be saying, well, how in the world are you a director of operations? So that for those who don't know a director of operations, it's the number two military member of a squadron. Mm -hmm. you know, how are you that if you didn't have a language degree? I'm like, well, I had to learn. Yeah. And that's one of the things that the Air Force doesn't say, okay, well, you didn't have a degree in it. I guess we're not going to use you there. It's like, no, this is where we've chosen you. Figure it out. Right. And so I've had to learn. My mantra has been, if I don't know it, I'm going to find the smart people in the room and I'm going to be best friends with them. They're going to teach me and I'm going to learn what I need to do. So that's what I've done throughout the course of my career. Because you have to learn to make the decisions because they're not going to look at you. You can't as an officer say, well, if the commander comes to you and says, can I do this mission? Can I do that? I don't know, sir. This wasn't my degree. So ask this other person. They're going to like, no, you're the officer. You need to tell me your recommendation and you need to tell me why you gave me the recommendation. What was the facts that led to that? And so you have to learn that job yeah. from there, 100%. Well, it seems to me that you're doing a pretty good job of it. I mean, you've made it this far, you know, you've made the rounds doing communications, doing space stuff yep. there at Buckley with the NRO. You've been an instructor building and molding mines, you know, so maybe if things go downhill, it's your fault. <laughs> exactly, <I don't> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I could be an instructor if something goes wrong. You made the transfer from Air Force to Space Force and, uh, you know, continue to support those effects, quote, downrange. Right? Exactly. You're doing a great job. Let's see if we can get a good story out of you. Okay. You know, think of like the pinch me moment, you know, the time where you're like... I cannot believe that the Air Force or the Space Force is actually paying me to do this thing right now. Ooh, okay. I think, one, the deployment was a really good pitching moment as a first lieutenant, having all that responsibility mm -hmm. and seeing just the missions and the, the missions we supported. Yeah, multiple. Uh, the multiple missions that we supported downrange was really, really cool. And you didn't really realize it. And you're going through the day-to-day, -day, you get up at 6, 
eat breakfast, sit in the office, respond to emails and stuff. But then when you take the time to stop and you see the missions that you're supporting mm-hmm. and they come up and thank you for the comm support. And normally the way that we were thanked with one particular mission was we got candies and food that we couldn't get normally, which was awesome. It was really neat to see it because you knew what that mission was yeah. and that they took the time to come by and say thank you. That meant a lot. And then when that team left, we actually got to spend time in their their tent compared to our tents and their tents were nicer. So that was really cool. Um, <laughs> it was really nice that they let us do that. That we got to finish our deployment in a much nicer tent, which was cool. So that's one. From a language perspective, all the trips that I've gone yeah. through, like I said, all like seven countries, I think so far, but twice to so Peru cool. is amazing. And I was like, I can't believe the Air Force and Space Force paying for you for do this. And then to combine cyber and space together, and I'm using hand gestures again, you know, combining the two of them together. And when I went to Peru and just mm-hmm. had to talk to the Peruvian military, their Air Force, Army, and Navy in Spanish about cyber and That's cyber so operations cool. was incredible and it was blowing my mind. And we ended up briefing like, flag officers and I didn't expect to but they said they want to learn and you're just like okay here we go Toastmasters and Intom through in speaking Spanish. in Spanish <laughs> here we go that was terrifying 100% terrifying but I was able to do it because of four years at the academy and 12 years of, of learning Spanish and that for me was really neat to be able to provide that experience to have that experience and be able to give back from a cyber perspective and then I'd say from an officer perspective this is a harder experience but it's an important one. So one of my airmen, uh, senior airman Michael Snyder, was unfortunately killed by a drunk driver back in 2014, if I remember correctly. And Michael and I had been on the base soccer team together. I was coaching the base soccer team. Mm -hmm. We were on a club team, so we played off base a lot in Denver. Um, So I knew him really well. And the commander knew that. And so I was able to be the escort officer to take him home to his family in Illinois, to the Snyder's family in El Paso, Illinois. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done. It's Mm -hmm. like the movie... um, Taking Chance with Kevin Bacon. His yeah, Kevin, chance. Kevin Bacon film. Film on that one. That movie's like spot on with how things work. Just totally like I stayed with Michael the entire time. Mm-hmm. We drove from, I think we landed in O'Hare and drove all the way. And you know, the lights, like in the movie where there's the cars behind him and they all turn on their lights. I mean, that happened when we were driving at night. Yeah. Just cars saw us and they started turning the lights on. And you're just like, Wow, it was probably one of the most emotionally challenging events that I've ever had, that I've ever seen. But as an officer, you know, you are first and foremost responsible for taking care of your troops, your airmen, and your guardians now in the Space Force. And being able to take that airman home to his family and become, and I'm still in contact regularly with his family, I'm still friends with them, and um, because of the bond that we share. But that was really special and important. So as an officer, knowing that. You know, I didn't lose anyone on my deployment, but I lost someone home station. Yeah. And that was not expected. Like one minute, no, literally that morning, I was taking a Spanish test. And I come in and I have three senior NCOs come, as soon as I come in the office, come in to me and say, LT, you need to go see the boss right now. And I'm like, okay, something really bad must have just happened. Mm-hmm. And go to the commander's office, he tells me, you're, you're not expecting that. But as an officer, you have to realize that at any time, deployment home station, there could be that call yeah. that we lost someone. And it's devastating. And you have to take a moment, don't take your car, go somewhere, cry, do what you need to do. But then you got to, it's like game time. Yep. You put on, as I referred to my service dress as my Superman outfit. I was like, you know what, as, if I'm not wearing service dress, I'm fine. But if I wear service dress, I've got to be completely game faced. There's no emotion. I am there to do a job to bring my comrade home. Yeah. And so you have to be aware of that responsibility from there because they do, they literally entrust parents all over the United States. And all in the world, they entrust their sons and daughters to us. Yeah. And that includes that if their son and daughter dies while in active duty, we need to bring them home. That's our responsibility. So that was a very special moment and really changed me because I had deployed right before then and that happened. Yep. So all those were very formative experiences for me. Like I took things seriously, but I now I really took things seriously. And so anytime I spend time, it's like, I need to make sure what I'm doing really, really matters from there because you never know how much time you have from there. Yeah. So very serious note. Very serious, very powerful, but thank you for sharing that with us um, because that is part of this experience. That is part of being in this profession of arms. You know, the reality is that people die and we need to be able to handle that, be able to operate within that and be able to move on from that and continue to get the mission done. Yes, we will honor them and we thank them for everything that they did. Thank them for their sacrifice, but we got to move on. Absolutely. We got to get the job done. 
All right, Reed, great conversation with Brian. We covered so much ground in this first part. There's still lots more to go. That's why we're going to bring a second episode here in a couple of weeks for the audience to listen to. But there's a couple of things that we need to pull out of this part of the conversation. First one that I want to talk about is the importance of project management as an officer. He comes at it from a perspective that is similar to my own, that the communications career field and also in the civil engineering career field. And maybe it's true for the support career fields more broadly. I've not been in those other career fields like force support or logistics, security forces or something like that, but definitely in comm and definitely in CE, the professional engineer or PE and the project management professional or PMP certifications carry a lot of weight, especially when you go to have conversations with outside entities, you know, third-party contractors, civilians within the squadron who that's what they do for the Air Force. They are project managers. And so he and I had the conversation about the importance of getting actual training and experience on project management. And I wanted to have that conversation with you, Reed, since you come from a different career field, different background. You've spent your time primarily in the Intel operations career field. And Do these same certifications, the PE, the PMP, and similar carry the same weight? If yes, why? If not, you know, how are they received? Yeah. So this one's really tough because I've seen failures of project management impacting ops and it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, I have also seen where that's kind of considered support, ancillary, not ops, right? And so when you take on those roles and you voluntarily say, I'm going to go get my PMP, it's kind of like, why? Why are you doing that? Are you trying to go do acquisition support to Intel? Are you trying to go that other route? So I'm really torn. I'm of two minds because in you and Brian talked about this, right? An officer, one of the things they bring is money, right? (laughs) It's one of the things we can do. And when your young airman comes to you with a thing that they want to do, how can I bring that to reality? It's with money. And if I need that thing, that widget, that capability, that tool, whatever it is, in order to operate at the right level, in order to advance the fight, in order to accelerate, but I'm not good at figuring that out, then I'm not doing my job well. So I'm really torn. I think this is a really... I think it's a little bit of a crisis that we have. Yeah. And it may be a little, I don't know. This feels uniquely Air Force, right? This executive, <laughs> like, are we businessmen or are we operators and warriors? You know, it feels so Air Forcey to me. I don't know why that's the case, but identity crisis. Yeah. I generally, I find that this is something that I would turn over to my contracting officer or my mm-hmm. program manager. So, my squadron, we have program managers. I have six, three alphas who. Okay. That is their job, is to help me get money on contract and help get things done. I also have a principal technical analyst or tech advisor whose job it is to help realize these grand visions of widgets in the future. So, yeah, they matter. But not necessarily directly toward ops, which is what you do. Yeah, so it's without the new future widget gizmo thing, Mm -hmm. I also can't operate. So it's a really tricky thing I find tends to be a thing people kind of decide. If this is what you want to do after, if you're leaning towards, you know, getting out and becoming a government contractor or something like that, working for a large defense company, yeah, pursue those things. I think you need to kind of define what success looks like for you. Yeah. Look inside. From my perspective, that's kind of how I see it. Bottom line, if anyone ever wants to get smarter, I'm never going to say <laughs> no, right? You, you yeah. take a class, read a book, whatever. But I've never one time been encouraged to do it. Obviously, very different from my experience and for Brian, the PE, the PMP, and and similar, very much encouraged in our career field. So much so that like, even just within uh, the last couple months, the Air Force Institute of Technology announced a new program where they're going to reimburse CE officers sitting for the PE or the PMP exam. And if you pass you get your money back, which is awesome because these are not cheap tests. They're not easily done. And so removing that barrier to entry and helping officers to pass that gate, pass that milestone will do a lot for the career field, but also for the officer themselves. 
And you mentioned the post officer, post military career, the PE, the PMP are huge out in the private sector, especially in the big company defense type world. If you're going to go design that widget or write that program or manage those who do those things. So like you said, if you want to get smarter, if you want to get more certifications, highly encourage it. Just know that depending on the career field that you may find yourself in, it may not be looked on as favorably as in others. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's funny, you know, a lot of the people that I do work with that are contractors or government civilians who need these skills or former operators, you know, uh, it's tough. But yeah, if you want to get better, get better. It's always a good thing. So Colin, that kind of leads me to something that kept coming up over the course of his discussion, even happens in the second half. And, and, and we won't cover that too much here. But he talks about how he went on a deployment that wasn't necessarily a good fit for him, but how important that was. And he also talks about how you need to kind of start building your legacy. And he talks about how important it is to learn joint. And all of that to me boils down to the importance of deployments in the development of a young officer. Right. And we've talked extensively about that. A couple things are coming to mind. First, these are really drying up, which is yes. great. I'm a huge fan, right? <laughs> Super happy. Yeah. If all we ever had to do was like sit back in our big, beautiful gray aircraft and like point at other countries and say, uh, 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 and if that's all it took, great, super happy. Yeah. So I'm grateful that we're not deploying at the rate that we used to. However, I am uncertain how or even if we can replace a deployment experience when it comes to a mechanism to force growth. And what are your thoughts on that? Because to me, they're almost irreplaceable. Yeah, well, I think first we need to define what the deployment experience is so that those who have not deployed, those who have no context are able to kind of have this conversation with us in their mind, right? Yeah. So both you and I have deployed at like actual, quote, deployment downrange in the sandbox. We've been there, done that, you know, for six months at a time, right? You know, because you can have deployments that are much shorter. You know, a deployment is really just a different pot of money. Yeah. You know, it's who's funding it, um, what your responsibilities are. But we're talking about like your extended TDY away from your home station, away from the United States, OCONUS. During GWAT, it always meant to the sandbox, but doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could be down to South America. It could be to Africa, Australia, whatever. Whatever, right? So what are we talking about in terms of the deployment experience downrange? Yeah, I. the best way I can explain it is I want you to imagine a football stadium. Okay. Normal life, the range of emotions, the depth and profundity of life experience happens basically like two or three yards either side of the 50-yard line. Right. That's like the extent of the worst day of your life and the extent of the best day of your life. Okay. And and that's also not to minimize people who've had, you know, pretty extreme experiences. But just if you take, you know, John and Jane average and say, this is your life experience. Your worst day is about three or four yards to the left. Your best day is about three or four yards to the right. And that's your whole experience. Yeah. A deployment is like running ladders from one end zone to the other <laughs> all day for six months. Yeah. Every moment, it is one high to one low that you just cannot, you cannot describe what that feels like. And that changes the rest of your life. You'll come back to normal life, to that six-yard window of normal, and you're just like, meh. <laughs> like, it really takes a lot. And so the things that you can't replace, I don't think you can replace the pace. Yeah. The pace of operations, the hyper focus. Yeah, like goings away, decorations, uh, EPRs, OPRs, admin, queep, like all the normal things that take up a huge amount of your time don't exist almost entirely. Yeah. It's all job. Yeah. And so you will do more in a week and a deployment than you may do in a year at home station. And then just keep doing it. Yeah. Just keep it going. So just, that's kind of the way I like to describe deployment when you don't have any frame of reference. That and being in an austere 
less than comfortable environment, you know, the pressure cooker kind of situation where the air conditioning is not always working, the internet or the Wi-Fi, the cell service, the communications back home. And here's where we lose every Marine and Army officer listening to our podcast. However, (laughs) continue, because that's totally true, right? I heard somebody say once when I was at LUD, they're like, you know what? If they wanted a revolt, all they'd have to do is stop the Wi-Fi. This place had burned to the ground. And I'm like, oh man, we're so Air Force. I love it. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, Air Force for a reason. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, we love our Army and Marine brethren and sisters. So we're going to own our Air Forceness here yes, for a moment. Absolutely. Okay. You know, send us a comment. Send us an email. Tell us what you think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Austere. We're not talking about out in the field, digging your own foxhole like the Super Hua folks do. We're talking about downrange. Yeah, there's still Wi Fi, but it may not be very good. And that changes the way that you operate your day to day life. If you can't, have a consistent and well-connected conversation with the people you love, that's really frustrating. But at the same time, it drives you to connect with the people who are there with you at a deeper level. And that's something that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And has a huge impact on how you operate in that deployment and how it changes you, the impact that it has on you. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, I let off with this idea I would argue that they're irreplaceable. And I don't think I'm alone in saying that, that the deployment experience from a training and, you know, development perspective, I believe they're irreplaceable. But what do we do? I think there are things we can do. Exercises, I think absolutely. You need to take advantage of those. Any sort of short term, get out of garrison and go do something. And it's funny, you know, you asked him later, about, you know, some pinch me moments. Yeah. All of the best and most amazing pinch me moments, Colin, happened on deployment. Yeah. All of them. All of the, you know, really important life lessons or, you know, officership lessons almost entirely happened on deployment. And I think in a day where we have less deployments, grateful for that, you need to take every opportunity to do something else, something additional, something extra, something different. And I get it, right? husband, uh, father of three, life is going on. It's hard to leave. I just think the list of things that should keep you away from those experiences needs to be very short. And that's my recommendation. Anytime somebody comes to me like, hey, you know, I've got this opportunity, might go here, but I don't want to be gone. It's always go first if you can. Yeah. And I would agree with you. You know, if there's an extended exercise or a series of exercises that you volunteer for them, you take advantage of those things as best you can. If there's a 30 or 45 day TDY somewhere, do it for sure, right? If there is a six month deployment, do it, right? If it's right for you, right for the family, if the situation is such that you can do that and, you know, things aren't going to burn down behind you do it, right? But recognize that the things like the exercises, the short-term TDYs and stuff like that are not a replacement for the deployments. Yeah. Right? They're just not. It's practice. And there's nothing to diminish that, but there's nothing like getting in the game. So one thing else that I wanted to ask you about this, Reed, is maybe we have some confirmation bias on this because that's the experience that we went through where we grew up. We are a product of GWAT and multiple deployments and stuff like that. But prior to GWAT and now hereafter in near peer competition, the norm has been not to deploy. Do you think maybe that what we've experienced is out of the ordinary and now we're just kind of back to normal? I think that's true. Rosa Brooks in her book, um, How Everything Became War and the U.S. Military Became Everything, Stories from the Pentagon, she mentions that. She talks about how, you know, periods of war and extended overseas deployments are actually unique in history as you look back over time. So, yes, I do think we have a bias there, you know, and I'd have to do some more, you know, scholarship on this. But I am not alone in saying there are valuable experiences you can only get deployed and those things matter, especially in first contact. You know, can't go in too much depth, but if I'm a nation and I have not been in a conflict in 30, 40 years, and I'm going to pick a fight with someone who's been in conflict, I'm going to pick the side of the person who's looked somebody in the face 
and been there. Yeah. There's real value to that. Again, I agree with you. I just have to ask the other side of it because, you know, we want to cover our bases and know that there are lots of officers, even during GWAT, that never deployed and they're still effective, right? Absolutely. And so we don't want to leave those people out. No. And I also don't want to diminish anyone's service in any way. Yeah. But when it comes to the mission of the United States Air Force, there is nothing like getting reps. You just can't replicate it. All right. Colin, last thing I wanted to bring up before we wrap this up. He mentions a movie, Taking Chance, talking about a dignified transfer and accompanying a fallen member of the armed forces. Great film. Yeah. Really good film. Make sure you're in a happy place. All the feels. (laughs) All of the feels. Yeah. So I haven't seen this movie yet. I think I'm going to have to watch it here shortly. I don't know if I am ready for it, though. Yeah. It's one of those that... I would not do it if there's even any little delicacy going on in life. (laughs) You know, like make sure everything is good. I mentioned in the interview that I was there at Vandenberg with Brian. I just got back. Life is pretty crazy here right now, so I think I'm going to hold off. But yeah, audience, go watch the movie and let us know what you think of it, right? Yeah, fantastic film. Again, thanks, Colin, for finally getting a 17. And thank you, audience, for listening in. We're really looking forward to bringing you the second part of this conversation especially as he gets into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of these career fields. And so looking forward to bringing that to you next week. Don't go away. Stick around. We'll bring you the second half of the episode here in two weeks. Until then, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.